Our next speaker is Miriam Hibble, who also was a regular for many years uh, with Bob at the program. Uh, Ms. Hibble was the Director of Law at Brooklyn Defenders for 15 years. Previously, she was a senior supervising attorney at the Criminal Appeals Bureau of the Legal Aid Society and taught appellate advocacy as an adjunct professor here at Brooklyn Law School. An authority in the area of identification law, she has argued leading identification cases before the Court of Appeals, uh, including People versus Chip, and is the author of the comprehensive treatise, New York Identification Law, which she has here if you want to purchase. Um, just one copy? <laughs> oh. Uh, Ms. Hilbel has been a frequent guest speaker at training programs in criminal law symposia throughout the state. Please welcome Ms. Hibble. Hi. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk about some recent or within the past year cases decided by the Court of Appeals and how they might impact on significant areas of identification law. Um, None of them are in my book because I'm in the process of updating my book right now. So the first one is People versus Marshall. And the question there was, does the prosecution have to serve notice, pretrial notice under 71030, of a viewing by the complainant in the prosecutor's office done as part of trial preparation? Up until Marshall, the answer was no. And that had been established by People versus Herner. Now, in Marshall, what happened is the complainant was assaulted on a bus, and she described her assailant to the police, but the assailant had fled. About two weeks later, she sees her alleged assailant in a hospital pharmacy. She calls the police. They come. They arrest him. A year and a half later, fast forward, the case is being prepped for trial. And the prosecutor tells the court and the defense attorney that the previous day he had the complainant in his office and showed her the defendant's arrest photo, which he said he was showing her because he wanted some clarification about her description of the defendant's hairstyle. At that point, the defense attorney requested a, quote, Herner hearing. What, what's a Herner hearing? Under Herner, the court had said, even though these confrontations between the eyewitness and the defendant's image are not identifications under 71030. It's a good idea for cor courts to explore the circumstances to see whether there's any impact, suggestive impact on the future in court identification. But such hearings were discretionary, and they didn't fall under 71030. But in Marshall, the defense attorney requested a Herner hearing, and the court granted the hearing. At the hearing, the prosecution, um, the defense requested that the prosecutor testified, and the court denied that request. But the complainant herself testified, and she said, well, it was a blurry photo that was shown to me. I didn't really pay attention to it. It didn't influence my identification. And she also admitted that the prosecutor, she could not recall being asked any questions about the defendant's hairstyle, which the prosecutor had said was the ostensible reason for showing the photograph. So at that point, the court ruled that this was trial preparation under Herner and denied the further request for a Wade hearing, even though at the hearing they went into the facts of the crime, et cetera. So in Herner, it had been not a very different factual scenario. In Herner, the prosecutor during trial prep, pretrial meetings, had shown the complaining witness a photograph of the lineup, basically saying, do you remember coming down to the precinct viewing a lineup? Is this it? Yes. And showed her the photograph again the next day. And the Court of Appeals had made pretty clear that that type of confrontation between the witness and the defendant's image was not an identification subject to 71030s, to any of 71030s procedural requirements, notice, hearing, or potential suppression as an identification. And as I said, the court had encouraged um, some form of judicial scrutiny of these confrontations. And in Herner's wake, many courts did, in fact, accord the defense some 
hearing or some inquiry about the circumstances of that confrontation, but short of a full-blown Wade hearing and as distinct from a Wade hearing. And further, upon finding that it was trial preparation, just ruled it's flat out not subject to suppression or the Wade hearing in the first instance. So now, 20 years later, the Court of Appeals says, in so many words, we made a mistake in Marshall. What, was the, what were the animating motives for the court to decide? They cited two things. One, we are now much more sensitive to the risks of mistaken identification, and we are more aware based on all the scientific research on memory and perception, that any kind of suggestive encounter um, in any way, shape, or form can have an effect on um, an undue, unnecessarily suggestive effect on the witness's ability to make an identification. So they basically just got rid of Herner's trial preparation exception to 71030. And I quote, we can find no basis to maintain a distinction between viewings of a defendant's image in preparation for trial and any other out-of-court identifications. Upon a defendant's motion, a court must hold a formal pretrial hearing to determine whether the police or prosecutor conducted an out-of-court identification procedure that exposed the witness to defendant's identity in an unduly suggestive manner. So that's a pretty blanket statement that any confrontation by state actors, because remember you do need the state action requirement, by state actors, police or prosecutor, between the defendant or his image and an eyewitness is something about under which is something that falls under 71030's procedural requirements, notice, weight hearing, potential suppression. The court then went on to find the erroneous denial of a weight hearing, <coughs> harmless error because it said that the court had implicitly found independent source in the case based on the complainant having testified at the hearing um, about the crime, her opportunity to observe, and the insignificance of the photo itself. So now the, this is really annoying. So now the question is, or the questions are, or the questions that occurred to me um, are, what are the implications of Marshall other than overruling Herner? First, I found interesting, and maybe because this is retire, retirement sort of boredom, but um, <laughs> what, what about the timing of the notice? 71030, if you remember, requires that notice be served within 15 days of arraignment, arraignment of, on the prosecutable accusatory instrument. Premature notice is fine, late notice is not, but it's a 15-day, it's a strict 15-day rule. On day 16, if the prosecution serves notice and says, oh, I can't say, oh crap, um, the police didn't tell me about it, or you know, my, my law assistant didn't mail it, it's too bad, even if you're two years ahead of trial. It's a strict 15-day rule. Well, what do you do if the identification hasn't come into being yet? If we're talking about trial preparation, we're invariably many, many moons after arraignment on a prosecutable instrument. So what time rule applies? Um, the answer according to me is, <laughs> number one, we'll have to see. Number two, the case law in comparable circumstances is sort of both sparse and unresolved because there are other instances where identifications do come into, uh, identifications that we previously understood without question were identifications come into being more than 15 days after um, the arraignment. In, the, in those circumstances, there was, there still is a split of lower courts, only a literally a handful of cases that have even discussed it, some saying if the evidence didn't come into being, there's simply no obligation. Um, some cases saying a reasonable period of time, and one appellate court case saying where the prosecutor learned of um, a photo identification 
um, that happened well after the, 20, the 15 days had expired. His waiting 26 days was sufficient um, because it was well in advance of the hearing and the trial. There's some argument that you can apply the discovery rule, um, which require the prosecution to serve discoverable material within a reasonable period of time. Um, I think it is going, I, I personally think that once the Court of Appeals has said this is an identification within 71030, we can't expect the prosecution to serve notice of evidence that's not yet in being, but it sort of, it does make sense to look to the 71030 notice as the easiest and most straightforward um, and least arbitrary guideline that within 15 days of that identification taking place, that's when he serves notice, especially since it's the prosecutor himself who is going to be aware of those facts since he's the one who's calling the complainant into his office um, and showing the photo of the lineup, the photo of the defendant, whatever. So I think a 15-day rule would make sense with the same exceptions, good cause for delay or alternatively any notice violation you know is waived by defense counsel making a motion to suppress. I think another interesting question is who testifies to this procedure? Because if the prosecutor is the one who is conducting the photographic, the trial prep as you would expect the prosecutor to be doing, um, how do you deal with the advocate witness rule? Do you, have, you, do you bring in another prosecutor? How do you deal with just the logistics of having the prosecutor testify at the Wade hearing? Because remember, this is happening now at the Wade hearing. So what you have is, let's say there was a lineup, um, or in, in Marshall, for example, there was the um, arguable show up. Um, so you're gonna have a detective and then the prosecutor just takes off that hat and then gets on the stand and calls in another prosecutor. Um, maybe, and it's interesting that in Marshall itself, the court denied counsel's request to have the prosecutor testify and instead the complainant testified. Now prosecutors might not want complainants testifying at the Wade hearing unless they have to have them testify. So that puts the prosecutor in a strategic bind figuring out which is best. On the other hand, there is certainly advantage to having the, pr the complainant testify um, because the complainant, quite simply, lacks the motivation to justify their behavior. And what we see in Marshall, and I'm being somewhat cynical, but not excessively so, um, what we see in Marshall, interestingly, is the prosecutor had said, oh, I showed the photo just so that I could get some clarification on the hairstyle description, and the complainant testified, I don't even think he asked me anything about hairstyle. So, um, so that's an interesting question, should the complainant testify? Now, if the complainant testifies, and remember I am the person who argued and lost Chip about the complainant testifying about at the hearing, so um, I, I say this having been once burned, um, if the complainant testifies and the issue is the complainant's testimony as to this trial preparatory identification procedure, the complainant's testimony can fairly be thus limited. It's not an opportunity for the defense attorney to start cross-examining about the crime or opportunity to observe unless the court decides that it's beneficial, now that you have the complaining witness there, to take testimony on independent source anyway, which the Court of Appeals, as you know, in Burt's encouraged, you know, not to bifurcate hearings if there's any reason to to believe that you might be reaching the independent source inquiry. Now, if the complaining witness doesn't testify at the Wade hearing as to the tr trial prep identification, can defense counsel request a uh, voir dire outside of the presence of the jury once the complainant is testifying at trial? I certainly think that that would be a good thing to do. Um, you know, even if you just look at Marshall and just say, Judge, may I, before the complainant testifies as to anything else, may I, outside of the presence of the jury, ask a couple of questions about this trial prep procedure. So that's another option to question the complainant on that. The third thing that I think is an important implication from Marshall is how clearly the court 
said that the motivation for showing the photograph, the motivation for the confrontation between defendant and, or image and the eyewitness was irrelevant. And I quote, the concern that a pretrial identification will result in witness error is the same regardless of the people's motive. Whether the procedure is intended to refresh or anchor the identification of the defendants and the witnesses memory before trial or intended to assist the DA in ADA in preparing the case, the relevant inquiry remains the same. Was the observation of the defendant unduly suggestive, rendering the subsequent identification unreliable? The reason I think that is interesting is that um, the Court of Appeals way back in Gissendanner suggested that 71030 should be read with a certain judicial overlay. And the language that they used is police arranged confrontations for the purpose of identifying the criminal actor. And those terms, police arranged, that's where we got state action. Arranged, that's where we eliminated purely spontaneous and inadvertent IDs. And for the purpose of ascertaining the identity of the criminal actor, that's where we got the confirmation exception, which really wasn't for the purpose of establishing who the guy was, but to confirm, yes, that's, you know, that's my husband who I meant when I said my husband beat me. Um, so yet, there have been a whole other number of identifications that have been excluded based on what the police motive was in showing a photo or, um, you know, even in the most innocent way, picking something off the street and saying, is this, you know, is this your ID? And the victim says, no, that's the guy who assaulted me. And, you know, a case like that said, well, the cop wasn't showing the photo with the intention of establishing the identity of the criminal actor. Maybe Marshall undercuts that a bit. Um, not that there is a big category of cases out there, but there are some that look at what the purpose was or what the motive was. I mean, I don't think it changes confirmations, but those little quirky cases sometimes that stand or fall on what the motive was behind the police or the prosecutor in confronting the witness with the defendant's image would seem to fall outside um, would seem to fall because the real relevant category is what did that confrontation do in terms of potential suggestiveness? It may be that it was ultimately it will ultimately be deemed non-suggestive, but shouldn't that be subject to a judicial inquiry? And finally, um, in a similar vein, what does Marshall do for to the fact that the prosecutor doesn't intend to offer? at trial um, the, the witness's identification of the defendant. If the prosecutor has the witness in their office and they're showing a photo of the defendant or a photo of the lineup and saying, do you remember seeing this? Yes. And do you remember which one you picked out? Yes, number three. That's not an ID that the prosecutor is likely going to intend to offer at trial. So um, yet in 71030, there is specific language in the 71030 notice statute itself saying that what the people have to specify in their notice is um, number one, they have to serve notice of their intention to call a witness at trial who is going to identify the defendant in court having previously identified him and comma, specifying the evidence they intend to offer, which has got us into a little brain tug of wars with the whole photographic area, but here the prosecutor doesn't intend to offer it, and yet Marshall makes clear that they still have to specify it um, and serve notice of it. So that's another tension created, and what does that do to the intent to offer language, um, which we also saw, by the way, in a case called Trammell, where the witness didn't identify the defendant, then changed his mind, called the prosecutor and said, well, I could have, but I didn't want to, and then the prosecutor served notice, and by then it was too late, and the Court of Appeals had to grapple with, you know, what do we do with this? And they ultimately found no notice violation because the prosecutor did not, quote, intend to offer 
the ID until they knew it was an ID. Um, so the Brady issue of disclosure was a separate one. So I think that's an interesting um, repercussion of Marshall as well, depending on how broadly or narrowly you want to read it. But bottom line is it gets rid of the trial prep exception, and I think that's significant because I can't imagine that there's a prosecutor around who doesn't, in preparing a witness for trial, review the lineup, if there was one, show a photograph, you know, in some way, shape, or form, confront the witness with the defendant's image. So I think it's going to be um, hugely significant, even in, even in its most limited holding. Okay. Um, I'm going to turn to expert testimony, uh, because there are two recent cases by the Court of Appeals in this area. Um, and the overriding question is, do these cases signal a retreat from the court's embrace of expert testimony in the area of eyewitness identification? First, we have People versus Berry, B-E-R-R-Y. In that case, the trial court had allowed test expert testimony on weapon focus and the lack of correlation between confidence and accuracy. And I'm presuming among you some familiarity with what's happened and been happening in the past 15 years in the area of expert testimony and some of the subject matters about which the experts uh, the testify. So the court had allowed expert testimony by the defense on weapon focus and the lack of correlation between confidence or certainty and accuracy, but had disallowed the expert's testimony on potential effect of event stress, the theory being that stress does not make your brain an etch-a-sketch and implant the image in your mind, but instead can have a debilitating effect on your ability to focus and remember because of the trauma um, and being frazzled or whatever. Okay, so the appellate division reversed finding that under the established precedent, including a half a dozen cases by the Court of Appeals, it was error to disallow that testimony. The Court of Appeals um, then, I'm sorry, that was withdrawn, that, that I think was in McDonald. Okay, so the court allowed that. Um, then the Court of Appeals upheld this exclusion of the, the event stress factor. The first thing that the court really hammered the defense on was that defense counsel had never made a motion in limine and seeking, you know, with the, with the um, supporting the request. And when the prosecutor even responded and said, what are the parameters of the expert's testimony, even then the defense did not submit um, support for the testimony on these, um, on event stress to show that it met the threshold level of Fry. So the Court of Appeals noted that factor in justifying the trial court's exclusion. But the court went on to say that um, the judge's ruling was okay because the judge, and dismissed their own precedent saying, well, the judge had not excluded expert testimony in its entirety. It had, only, it had allowed two of the factors and not the third. Um, let me just say parenthetically, that rationale <coughs> doesn't seem to make sense because either the testimony is admissible or not, so you have to analyze it as error or not, and the fact that the court allows some relevant evidence but not different or other topics of relevant evidence be begs the question, should it or should it have not? And I think that we can then turn to what the court ultimately said in the case was that the trial court was entitled to find that the event stress factor, which remember defense had not supported with any evidence to show that it met the Fry test, was also not all that relevant in the case because the complaining witness had seen the defendant uh, in another context 90 minutes before the event. So they said, so therefore, the premise of event stress, which is that 
this is sudden and the, the stress of the event is just going to prevent you from getting mental picture was undercut enough that the trial court could exercise its discretion and say as to that factor, um, the court, uh, the, test, the expert can testify. So what, is, what, are the significant, what are the implications of Barry on its face? On its face, I think it really underscores that defense attorneys have to do their homework and have to make an appropriate supported motion. To some degree, that is qualified by the fact that courts can take judicial notice of many of the factors that have been allowed, including approvingly, by the Court of Appeals themselves as meeting the Fry test. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every single time with regard to every single factor. But interestingly enough, while the Court of Appeals has spoken on many of the factors, it has not specifically spoken on event stress, which is interesting because that's the one involved in Barry. So maybe that's part of the reason. In fact, in one of the Court of Appeals cases, I think it was um, Abney, I'm not, I, don't remember off the top of my head, but they said that the, tr the error was in the trial courts not um, granting a Fry hearing on a number of factors, including event stress, and they remanded for a Fry hearing. So I think that it may be that the Court of Appeals was simply <coughs> saying there ought to be a Fry hearing next time on, um, and that the defense does have the burden to justify the admission of the evidence. Second, what is the status of the admissibility of expert testimony on event stress? Well, as I just said, I don't think the Court of Appeals is signaling that it's not yet meeting the Fry test. It's just saying that there was no determination in this case, and for the same reasons the Court of Appeals might have remanded in another case for a hearing on event stress and other um, factors. They didn't do so here because there had never been that motion in the first place. So one could say that Barry is really limited to its factual anchor, that the defense failed to make a motion in limine or in any way supply the requisite evidence establishing that event stress met the Fry test, and even had the defense done that, a court could have made that very narrow exception and said, well, I'm letting the expert testify on A and B, which have been established. I'm not letting him testify on C, which you haven't proven to me is established um, as admissible under Fry. But even if it were, I think it's less significant in this case because of the facts of this case, and that's a ruling, that's ultimately the ruling that the Court of Appeals upheld. That would all be well and good, um, and we could just dismiss um, Fry as having very limited impact if the Court of Appeals hadn't then decided um, People versus McCullough. In McCullough, what happened is you had four people break into a store. Uh, it was a bar barber shop. There was a fatal shooting, and um, they fled in a getaway car. The eyewitness identifies the defendant in a photo array. Um, a few weeks after the crime, saying he looks like the shooter. Two months after that, he identifies the defendant in a lineup, in which the defendant was the only common denominator from the photo array, saying that he is one of the shooter's accomplices. An accomplice who pled guilty as the getaway driver testifies at trial and it implicates the defendant very strongly, albeit circumstantially, in the crime, but basically says, he drove him there and, and saw him later. So it's, it's fairly strong, and the eyewitness, of course, identifies. So the trial court denies the defense request to call expert testimony in the first instance, saying that under the expert testimony standard set forth in Legrand or whatever, um, you first have to look at, is this really an ID case, and is there quote, little or no corroboration. If there's little or no corroboration, then we look at whether the expert's testimony is going to be relevant in the case, whether it's given by an appropriate expert, et cetera. And the trial court had ruled that the accomplice's testimony was sufficient co corroboration so that you don't need the expert. And the appellate division, that's the case. In McCullough, the appellate division reversed. The Court of Appeals then reverses the appellate division, 
and upholds the trial court's complete exclusion of expert testimony. It was a very divided court. It was a 4-3 decision. And what is remarkable, at least to me, is that um, there is no analysis other than this. After two sentences just reciting general principles about expert testimony um, on identification, the entire analysis in McCullough is this, and I quote, to the extent that Legrand has been understood to require courts to apply a strict two-part test that initially evaluates the strength of the corroborating evidence, it should instead be read as enumerating factors for trial courts to consider in determining whether expert testimony on eyewitness would aid a lay jury in reaching a verdict. Courts who are reviewing such a determination simply examine whether the trial court abused its discretion in applying a standard balancing test of pre prejudice versus probative value. And based on that, they said the trial court was within its rights <coughs> to exclude the evidence, period. Now, a very lengthy three-judge dissent basically said, what are you talking about that Legrand is not the standard? It was said in Legrand, it's been said in five or six cases by the Court of Appeals since, and the precedent is very clear. You first look at, basically, is this an ID case? And the language in Legrand is, does the case, quote, turn on the accuracy of identification with little or no corroborating evidence connecting the defendant to the crime? Once you determine that there's little or no, if you determine that there is corroborating evidence and it's not little or nothing, then that takes it out of an ID case, or at least it takes it out of the court's obligation to then turn to what aspects of the testi expert testimony admissible. But if there's little or no corroboration, then it's enough of an ID case that the court must then look at, does the expert testimony um, relate to the facts of the case? Is it a proper expert? Is it a proper subject for the expert to testify? And that second step is um, evaluating the particular expert testimony, testimony's admission in the particular case. So to the dissent, the only question in this case was, did this accomplice's testimony sufficiently corroborate? Um, did it constitute little or no corroboration? And the dissent, parsing a lot of facts, said it didn't because despite being an accomplice and despite implicating the defendant, the accomplice himself was so inconsistent and so unreliable that unreliable corroboration evidence is tantamount to no corroborative evidence. And the facts that they mention are, include the fact that the accomplice had never met the defendant before the night of the crime. Um, he had failed to identify him from photos, despite having identified the other guys who were involved. He gave conflicting testimony on key details, and he secured a very favorable plea bargain. So, I mean, the, the dissent felt that the issue was little or no corroboration, and that's what the Court of Appeals should have been addressing in the first instance. So, um, the, as far as the Legrand test, the dissent said, it is so clearly established and reaffirmed by Legrand that they basically dismiss it in a footnote, saying, Legrand did not simply list factors to be considered, rather, or ignored by the courts without guiding standards or structure, rather, Legrand established a legal framework with two specific areas of inquiry to be applied by courts when determining the admissibility of expert testimony and eyewitness ID. So now are Miriam's list of questions as to what this means. One, does McCullough overrule Legrand's two-step analytic framework governing the admissibility of expert testimony on eyewitness ID. First, let me say, in the 15 years from Lee, when the Court of Appeals first addressed the issue of expert testimony on ID, to McCullough, it's been 15 years, the Court has decided Lee, Young, Legrand, Abney, Santiago, and now McCullough and Barry, Barry and if, any, if you can connect any series of dots, it is unmistakably clear 
<clears throat> that the court has gone towards increased welcoming and embracing of expert testimony on eyewitness identification because it's been giving um, <clears throat> what, what I hope wasn't lip service to the idea that all the research and scientific study done on misidentification, DNA exonerations, and how memory and perception work have led the court to strongly urge and then ultimately require the admission of expert testimony under that two-step test if it is fulfilled. So what are they doing now? Now, if you take McCullough at face value, my answer is yes. They do seem to overrule Legrand insofar as saying that that two-step inquiry no longer needs to be undertaken. The two-step inquiry being, one, you look at whether there is corroborative evidence, whether it is little or none, or otherwise. If it is little or none, you then move to the admission of the expert testimony in the particular case. Do the subject matters relate to the facts? Is this an expert? Has the, has the area achieved general consensus among the scientific community? So if, Legrand, if Marshall, in fact, says that test is out the window, what, in fact, is the new analytic framework, and how does it differ? And my answer is, I don't have a clue what McCullough is saying when it says those are just, you know, sort of optional factors, and ultimately we look at balancing prejudice versus probative effect, which it said would be the review standard. So I, I, I honestly, if you were a trial judge and you came to me and said, what am I supposed to do? I don't even know how to articulate a prejudice versus probative balancing test. I can't swear that that's in fact the test that you should be applying as opposed to the reviewing court when you screw up on the ruling and then the reviewing court will be pro applying prejudice versus probative. I would certainly say at the very least do two different analyses. Do this is the admissibility, I'm applying the Legrand test. You can never be faulted for applying the Legrand test and finding the evidence admissible or inadmissible under Legrand. But if you want to do a mishmash of factors, do that as an alternative. As courts sometimes will do, just say, you know, under this standard, it would, you know, be inadmissible anyway or admissible anyway, but alternatively this. Um, and finally, what, what is going on with the Court of Appeals? And what troubles me is I think that between Barry and McCullough, the court might be retracting from what we had hoped, or I had hoped, or some of us had hoped, was an embrace of expert testimony on identification for the simple reason that the research is showing us, if nothing else, that jurors don't get it. That the research into juror conception, to me, is as interesting as the research into memory and perception and factors affecting ID, because it shows that jurors have abiding misconceptions on a lot of things that are very relevant to suggestiveness and mis-ID. And this should be something that affects all of us, because whether you're a prosecutor or a defense attorney, at the end of the day, it's best to have an idea of what might determine for your benefit or for the jury's benefit whether they got the right guy. Okay, so... Um, the last thing I want to talk about is the prosecution's burden of going forward at the Wade hearing and the case of People versus Holly. In that case, it was your fairly typical ID from a computer. The, the, complain, the um, witness is looking through a number of screens, picks the defendant out, et cetera. At the Wade hearing, the prosecutor does not present the screens, the six photo screens that the witness had looked through, nor even the screen that the witness had picked the defendant's photo from. Um, so the question was, what is the consequence of the prosecution's failure to introduce those, that evidence uh, at the Wade hearing? And the Court of Appeal, the, at the Wade hearing, the defense had argued that a presumption of suggestiveness should attach to the prosecution's failure to produce the photographs 
and the Court of Appeals rejected the idea, uh, I mean, the trial court had rejected the, the idea of a presumption. Now, at the Wade hearing, because this is relevant, the detective had testified that he had plugged in race, gender, height, age, photos within the past three years. He also testified as to how the procedure had occurred, that the um, eyewitness had identified the defendant's photo from the second screen, continued to view another 13 to 14 screens, and identified two more photos of the defendant all being different. So the detective had detailed the information he had inputted and how the procedure had occurred, giving an approximate number of photos actually viewed. So the Court of Appeals held that the prosecution's burden to go forward required the prosecution to preserve and create a record of the identification procedure. Not only what the photographs look like, but the manner in which the procedure was itself conducted. So, quote, a detective who shows a witness photographs on the photo manager system or in a similar computer-assisted process must carry out whatever steps are necessary to ensure that he or she can recreate in some way during a suppression hearing the display of the photographs and the precise arrangement and order in which they were shown to the witness. And absent that, there's a presumption of suggestiveness. The presumption, however, can be rebutted by detailed testimony by the detective, and it was found in this case that the presumption was rebutted. So what are the implications of um, Holly? One, that the New York Court of Appeals has expressly adopted a presumption of suggestiveness from the failure to produce evidence of the identification procedure. There had been some debate whether it was an inference of suggestiveness, a presumption. It is a flat out presumption, which if not rebutted, defeats the prosecution's burden of going fo forward in the first instance. This is kind of timely uh, um, in terms of the duty to preserve or make a record of police procedures in light of everything that's going on with videotaping confessions. And it's interesting that the court specifically rejected the prosecutor's argument that what they were being asked to do is create evidence. The court said, no, we're not asking you to create evidence. We're saying you have a duty to preserve and make a record of the evidence, um, of the evidence that in fact is in existence, namely the identification. So it rejected the prosecutor's argument that creating or preserving this record is too cumbersome. And it left open what obligations would be imposed on the prosecution in light of either defense arguments or technology. And I think that that's kind of an interesting question because the court did not address what would happen if the defense says, why can't you just go in and put in the exact same data you just did and print out those screens? You know, would, would it come up with a different result? What if the defense had demanded a printout of the screens um, at the time? So there are a number of things that are still open to litigation depending on what the prosecution, uh, what the defense requests, what the hearing determines would be feasible in terms of recreating um, the actual identification procedure. The factors that the court will look at, and they looked at in, in Holly, were the fact that the detective did not yet consider any particular person a suspect. So theoretically, there would be less unconscious motive to select the category. That he testified to sufficient information about the data that he put in to ensure a fair selection. That there was a volume over 100 about 100 photos looked at, and also the fact that the witness picked three separate photos of the defendant, sort of bolstering the idea that it was not suggestive. So that, of course, raises the question of what will overcome the presumption in other cases if these factors were not present, or what happens if the detective did not make any notes of the data, identifying data that he put in. So you could argue not only did he not preserve 
the photos that were viewed, but he didn't even make a record of the data that he actually entered into the computer. There are no notes or anything. What if the detective gives vague testimony? What if his testimony is impeached? These are all factors that will remain to be um, litigated. But at least at face value, the court is imposing a duty on the prosecution to supply to the hearing court who has to review this identification what the identification looked like. And as far as transferring it to the lineup, there are certainly, you know, in a creative mind, ways that we can think that um, there might be greater obligations than some useless single black and white photo of a lineup. And so both prosecution and defense should be thinking about that as well. The prosecution may be being proactive and asking police to start doing color photos or videotapes of the lineup and the defense being, you know, um, proactive as well to start maybe raising some of those arguments at Wade hearings. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs>